Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving de decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Ted Blackman. He's the CTO of the Urbit Foundation, and also with Gary Lieberman. Uh, he works at Course One, and he leads our Urbit team. So once again, we're going to speak about Urbit. And but just be briefly before we get uh, into the podcast, uh, uh, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Our sponsor is Tally Ho. Tally Ho is an open source wallet, redefining the wallet as a public good. With Tally Ho, you can safely connect to DeFi, Web3, plus a lot more. You can view your NFTs in the wallet across Ethereum, Polygon, Optimism, and Arbitrum. And they have ledger support, so you can swap between assets and view all your account balances in the portfolio tab. They're also running a layer two adventure that rewards users for exploring the Arbitrum ecosystem with Tally Ho. You can get a space dog NFT and be entered giveaways for other NFTs. So head over to tally.cash to check it out. All right. So um, thanks so much, guys, for coming on. It's uh, it's great to do this episode. Really looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's start with you, Ted. Tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and. Um, sort of like how you found your way to where you are at this point. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm the CTO of the Urbit Foundation. I took over in this role about uh, two months ago. And for the five years before that, I was working at Talon as a core dev on Urbit. And um, so the first four years just writing code and then the last year, year and a half or so, I was also managing a number of people working on the kernel. Um, and uh, yeah, so I started working on Urbit full-time in 2017. Uh, I had first heard of the project in 2014, but didn't understand it. Um, and then in 2016, the docs were a lot better and I uh, started looking into them. And by that point, I had had enough varied experience um, writing code at a lot of different startups uh, as a as a founder and as a of, of several and as a, uh, an employee at many others. And um, I'd been doing that for 10 years, uh, starting in 2006, my first term in college. And it's very, I, I sort of lucked out that I actually graduated um, considering that. Uh, but um, but yeah, so I've been working in startups for a long time, seen a lot of different things, uh, robotics, distributed systems, web programming, um, and uh, the, um, so I had enough breadth of background to understand sort of why Urbit is interesting technically. Uh, not very much depth of background in that, in that much actually. So a lot of learning about networking and operating systems, programming languages, I've had to learn a lot of that on the job, uh, working on Urbit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was what interested me in the project primarily, uh, was just, I encountered it. I looked at it and thought, this gets a lot of stuff right that I've never seen gotten right before in program in a way that just, just the, the basic ideas of like what it is that you build a program out of, how those programs are situated, how they communicate with each other, what they do how the networking works, how identity works, how the operating system works, all this is so much cleaner than anything else that I'd ever seen. And I still feel that way. And uh, that's why I'm still excited to work on Urbit. Um, so yeah, so that's um, that's kind of my, you know, the recent part of my story. And and the uh, and now at, at Urbit Foundation, uh, so we've just switched gears to doing a lot of core development in-house. And so we're hiring a number of guys to, um, we, like we, we have hired a number of people and um, we will be hiring some more uh, to work on, to do more core dev. And so expanding the size of the core dev team, that's to work on the Urbit OS itself, uh, all the different parts of it, and really to push it over the hump to become a bulletproof consumer product. Cool. Thanks so much for, for that. I want to start, I, I want to also kind of get into something else briefly. So... You know, mo most of the listeners of this podcast, you know, generally talk about crypto. We have done some Urbit podcasts before. We did one in 2017 with Galen, uh, which I li re listened to not long ago and it's still pretty current. So we'll link to that in the show notes if people want to check it out. 
And then I think we did another one this year with Josh Lehman of the Urbit Foundation. He's the executive director of the Urbit Foundation. So there's like a little bit, but I still, I think most people, right? Urbit is not easy to wrap your head around. And I think most people kind of still struggle with that. So uh, it would be great if you could sort of describe for, let's say for this kind of audience, you know, that kind of gets crypto, that gets things around that, but maybe don't know about Urbit. Like what is Urbit? Sure. Yeah, well, I think for a crypto audience, I would say, you know, the one of the foundational, part of the foundational ethos of crypto in general is not your keys, not your coins, right? So you, you own your assets fundamentally through control of a private key. And one way to think about Urbit is that we're extending that not just to money, but to all of computing. So you own your computer, with a private key, you own that computer's identity on the network with a private key. And, um, and then you have full control over that computer. So what data it stores, what programs it runs, how it communicates, uh, with whom it communicates. Um, and, uh, and then all, and then all those apps that you install into it, the programs that you actually run on there, are designed to run in a decentralized manner. So there's no central server, no central point of failure, um, no central choke point. And um, that this is, um, so it's sort of, one way to think about Urbit is it's trying to build the same world that the rest of crypto is trying to build. And it's building all the pieces of that world that aren't on chain. Cause you don't actually wanna stick everything, all logic and all data uh, onto a blockchain. It's not the right solution for everything. It's the right solution for anything where you need Byzantine fault tolerance, right? So you need a global consensus on who owns what, or even global consensus on you know, which, uh, uh, you know, which transactions have been performed, right? For, you know, if you're sharing, if you're all sharing the same computer, like in Ethereum, right? You're all sharing the same computer. You just need a, a way to guarantee that we all share that same computer state, even if, um, even if it's adversarial. Um, but that's only a subset of the world of computing and for everything else where you don't want or need, uh, that kind of Byzantine fault tolerance, that's where Urbit comes in. So that's where like, I want to store personal data. I want to use chat. I want to do file sharing. I want to do video streaming, uh, for any of those things. Uh, yeah, you want, you want the world that crypto is promising, but blockchains can't do it. Individual applications can't do it very well because the current stack wasn't designed for a decentralized world. The modern internet, Unix, uh, all these things, they were not designed to be a sort of multipolar decentralized system. And so the Urbit thesis, the core of the Urbit thesis is that, which is actually older than blockchains, um, but that, that thesis is that fundamentally, uh, getting to a decentralized world, that same world that crypto promises, is a technical problem. And it's a technical problem that needs to be solved by an operating system that is designed from the ground up to support peer-to-peer -peer applications. Thanks, I really appreciate how you explained that. I think that's a, that's a very nice way of phrasing it. And I do think that hopefully works pretty well for you know people coming from, from a crypto Cool. I hope so. I've been trying for a while. You know, uh, Gary actually has his own way of describing it that, well, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I've heard you describe it very well. Um, I actually don't know if it, I mean, it could be explained better probably. I don't know if it really needs to be elaborated on necessarily. I mean, I, I think Urbit kind of is designed as a unified system. So in the context of like, if you're trying to organize your digital life, a lot of people do this by like only buying Apple products, for instance, or only using, you know, Google app suite for all of their productivity. And, you know, there's all these ways that you can try to unify the system that you use so that everything you use kind of makes sense with each other. And I think part of the Urbit thesis is that things actually make much more sense if you have a system that works for everybody for all purposes that is truly a universal language that people can come to consensus on without any compromises yeah that's so that's kind of like the idea of this you know um universal computing 
environment and I guess what ties in there is that a whole bunch of stuff that today I guess don't happen at the operating system level do happen at the operating system level in orbit right so like let's say something like authentication whereas you know today okay you want to sign in to some application then you can use like Google sign in with Google or you can use sign in with Apple and but but those are like separate separate kind of ecosystems and they're not quite not quite compatible whereas in orbit you have like Urban ID, and then that is a universal thing that anyone can access. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I think it's actually fairly obvious in the case of like, in a hypothetical world where there was only Urbit and, you know, Urbit had no incumbent that it was trying to argue against, it would be kind of obvious, I think, that identity is something that you only have one of. It's kind of baked into the word identity that you have one. Um, and so a lot of things that don't work properly in like the Web 2 ecosystem and even Web 3, actually, the reason why they're not quite compatible is because the identities just aren't compatible with each other. And so if you have a unified identity system at a very early point in the stack, a lot of problems just go away. They, they kind of um, it's not even that they're solved. It's that the preconditions for the problems never even come about. Yeah, that's right. Like most people don't know, for example, that. Uh, IP and TCP, you know, the protocols that the inter internet uses don't have any concept of authentication or encryption. Those have to be bolted on at higher layers. And uh, because of that, you get all kinds of issues. You get a whole field of IP security, IPsec, uh, DNS security, DNSSEC, right? Like these things basically shouldn't exist. They should be in the network protocols. But these network protocols are 50 years old before anybody even thought to use encryption. Uh, and before there were, you know, when there were maybe 10 people on the internet instead of you know, billions. So, um, yeah, so with Urbit, those, those things are built in at every packet is authenticated and encrypted. One, uh, one question actually, when Gary and I were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, the outlines and there's this question that I think is, is a good question to ask right here. So. You know, Urbit describes itself as this clean slate. And, you know, you talked about these like global protocols like TCP and I, IP. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how much of kind of the existing internet and computing stack, like how much does Urbit like throw away? And to what extent are existing technologies still being used in Urbit? Well, at a basic level, it throws them all away. Uh, and, um, but it's not the, that's not the whole story because, uh, despite that, uh, we know that Urbit must exist in the present and be useful for people in the present. And so, uh, Urbit also has the capability of acting as a web server to the old web and making web requests, HTTP requests. Um, so this allows you to access it from your browser, access it from your phone, um, you know, uh, have it serve uh, serve a blog for you, right? So the Studio app from Terrell lets you post a host a blog using your Urbit, uh, and even and they're working on uh, adding a paywall to that too, so you can even take payments through your Urbit. Um, so it Urbit is not uh, basically Urbit's building a whole new world unto itself, right? So everything from machine code, programming language, operating system kernel, set of applications, network protocol, identity system, all of that. But that new world can communicate to the old world uh, because, that's, can, because that's very important in practice. Cool, thanks for elaborating that. Well, maybe we can go to Gary also briefly. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about you and how did you get into Urbit and what was the thing that captured your attention when it came to Urbit? Um, I, I don't think my background is particularly interesting, but I, I was before, I mean, I knew about Urbit for a couple of years before I got really into it and I underestimated it for a very long time. Um, I would say what got me really into it was struggling with two things that I didn't quite understand were related. One was that I was trying to organize my digital life in a way that really made sense to me and optimize my workflows, kind of just running on the assumption that 
I realize I'm much happier and much more productive in my physical life when I'm well organized. So I should be able to apply that same logic digitally and just coming up against multiple blockers everywhere where it's like, okay, to actually solve this problem, it's like a full-time job for 10 people creating and maintaining a system that actually does what I want it to do. So that was one thing. And also just noticing on the other hand, I mean, it was right after COVID, um, just how dystopian Web2 was. It wasn't surprising to me at all that we had like this huge increase in like political violence and transgression at the same time that everybody was stuck in their houses with nothing but Web2 to entertain them. Like it, it seemed very clear that that was like an insanity inducing situation. And Urbit, I think, successfully made the case that that was also downstream from the same technological problems that led to my my own inability to organize my digital life in a way that was automated and made sense. Um, and so I gave Urbit the benefit of the doubt enough that maybe if I learned something about it, and I spent quite a lot of time learning it, that I could kind of test the assumptions and at least make a case for why it was or was not a waste of time. And by the time I was done and felt satisfied that I understood it, I was totally unable to recreate the conditions that I had before where I was not a complete urban maximalist. I can't even remember what it's like to, uh, to believe that there's any other possibility for the future of computing. Fairly common story, actually. You know, th there's this question I kind of wanted to get to at the end, but I think we should get to it now. So, you know, we've talked about you know, we've, we've touched on Urbit a bit, right? Like what's different and, you, you know, you guys have both alluded a little bit as to why you're excited about it. But if we, if we now kind of think forward and imagine that Urbit, you know, really accomplishes uh, the things it's trying to accomplish, right? Like, so it really, I get, so it, it you know, fully realizes its ultimate potential. What does that look like? How long does it take? And what does the world look like? What's different for people in the way they use technology, in the way they live their lives, in the way political systems work? You know, like what is, what are the kind of visions and ideas that you guys have around this? I can start with a few things. So um, one is that I think you'll end up with a lot more, well, localism is one word. And you end up with a lot more subcultures uh, that are sort of, uh, and each of those subcultures will be autonomous in a way that they aren't really digitally autonomous at the moment. Or if you're running a subreddit, the subreddit might just get shut down. Right? The, the mods could have a bad day and, uh, you know, and then you're not there anymore and that culture can be gone. Uh, you can have a, you know, be a Twitter poster and then, uh, you know, big following and then put your foot in your mouth one day and your account gets flagged by an AI and banned. And then years of work that you put into developing that audience and, um, you know, sort of building a whole network of personal connections based on that can just be blown away in an instant by essentially a mistake. Um, all right. And so this, this actually kind of puts a damper on, uh, the ability for sort of subcultures to form. And so you end up with more of a monoculture, right? So I think Trent from Holium said, you know, Facebook has 3 billion users and no culture. Uh, and um, that really stuck with me. So I think the, uh, you know, it's not entirely true. There's some, right? But, uh, but I think it's, what, what we'll see is a lot more of those, a lot, a lot more subcultures that, that are able to flower more, right? They're able to develop their own art, their own ways of communicating. Um, they may eventually physically co-locate they may do a biology style network state. They may do something else. Um, I think uh, that sort of digital, like the, the ability for people to coordinate, collaborate online uh, has been hamstrung by a lack of ability to, uh, for people to control their own software, right? So, you know, you're probably in some signal group chats um, and and not just signal scattered all over the place, really, right? But for any one of those, you can't you can't say, oh, well, let's let's fork signal the signal client, right? Like let's let's have it, uh, you know, integrate with something, um, right? Integrate with a calendar, 
even, or something basic, where there's just no way to do that. Um, because that's its own world, right? It's, it's siloed, right? And so basically that sort of limitation where you kind of can't just arbitrarily extend things, you can't arbitrarily get your programs to work with each other. That's a big cause of what, what Gary was saying that he ran into, but it also just prevents like groups, social groups and other kinds of organizations, uh, from, from being able to really, uh, make the most out of networked computers. Uh, so by, so Urbis sort of flips the whole situation on its head because right now you have to, you have to go through some big central server to do almost anything on the internet. Um, and instead it says, no, you can download an app into your Urbit, run it yourself. And you have full control over that yourself. And then you and people you want to collaborate with uh, have control over that, that small network. Uh, so it's much more bottom up. Uh, and so I think like we're really not used to seeing bottom up organization uh, digitally. But I think that what it's going to look like mostly is, yeah, better art, more art, um, better, like, I think, more seamless economic activity. Right, like people, a lot more people starting small companies, starting small, you know, little investment co-ops, um, starting you know, local businesses, uh, things like that. I think that, and getting local investment, right? So all sorts of things that, and all kinds of different modes of interactivity that are very difficult to build right now, right? Um, so you know, if um, there's an interesting example of this, which is an app called Radio on Urban that was uh, built a couple months ago. And it's sort of like a jukebox for video. So you all get into this room, you can set which video is playing and then and cue another video and, and then people can talk about it as it's going, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, a, not an earth shattering application, but it's, uh, it's something new. That's something that you can't build uh, otherwise. And so it's just sort of one little hint as, as to what sorts of, like you can just have this, uh, you know, there were lots of different kinds of interactivity, different kinds of bottom-up social organization that are um, infeasible in the modern computing setup. Yeah, and just one thing to add to that, I think of key importance is the idea that within a unified system, a small-time app developer can actually have a big impact because they are working within the same language as the rest of the world, meaning two things. In terms of culture, there can be an application made between friends in a group and not have this, you know, this big hump to overcome to actually get it usable between everybody. If I develop an app for just the people in my friend group, um, it's, it would be very easy in, in an urban world to just have them download it and try it and use it. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily have compatibility issues with the rest of their digital life. And that also makes a lot of sense in a business context. So, um, if you're running a business and you realize that you have a very lucrative small business model and you're asking the question of, you know, what would it take to franchise this business? Probably the answer to your question includes, you know, you need some kind of software system that, you know, that captures the entire business logic of your operation. And this is in practice not possible for most small businesses. You have to overcome a significant financial barrier to do that kind of thing. But on a unified, you know, uh, software ecosystem, it actually becomes quite, uh, quite a reasonable proposition. I wouldn't call it easy, but um, it's much more accessible to simply capture the logic of a business within one program. And that, I think, would lead to exponential productivity gains in pretty much any industry. Yeah, just to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so uh, there's... One of the big differences between writing code in Urbit and writing code for you know, the normal internet is uh, the distance between writing a toy and writing a production application. Right? So normally, uh, in the normal internet, normal computing, a programmer can take a weekend and write a toy. Right? And that toy would be you know, usable. It, it has the business logic. Right? Um, the sort of meat of the application is there but it's nowhere near something that people could use, right? So you can't just sort of have your friends use it, have it work, uh, have it be something that you know, is actually part of your lives. In order to get to that stage, you have to do a lot of DevOps, you have to, do, you have, to have some sort of authentication system, uh, maybe a few with backups, what happens if somebody forgets their email address or whatever, right? I mean, uh, 
you have to um, administer a bunch of servers. Uh, so you have to, to have some sort of cloud infrastructure. You may find yourself researching Kubernetes and Docker, um, right? And there's this whole long list of tools that the modern programmer has to be familiar with in order to actually deploy an application to users, even if it's just a web page. Um, and so it's that that difference between the you know the meat of the system and all the sort of rigmarole of a deployment. Um, that's what brings in a ton of extra cost that makes it prohibitive to just say, hey, you know, we've got a few friends here. Let's let's write a little app that does this thing that we needed to do. Um, and so uh, this is this is true already, right? So a good example of this is um, uh, Justin Murphy commissioned somebody to write uh, an app called Page, uh, and it um, it lets you copy some HTML into your Urbit and serve it as a web page. Because uh, he just needed to serve some simple stuff. So he asked somebody to build this for him. I think he paid him $500, took a weekend. And now that app exists. I installed it on my Urbit. It works fine. All right. So I was able to download this, run it myself um, on my own Urbit, right, from $500 worth of work. Um, and that's, that's a fairly unusual setup. And we're going to make that even better in the future. Um, to, so if we'll reduce that cost even further, and that difference will continue to increase. Uh, so that's I, I think one of the one of the things that's most exciting from a developer standpoint. It's like yeah, you can about Urbit is that you can write something, publish it, it, literally in a weekend, and it's real. It's already real. Yeah, I mean this is one of the ways if I explain Urbit that I also tend to emphasize is you know if, if you're developing. And a web application or some kind of application in normal web that because you have these additional things that, okay, now I'm going to have to run some infrastructure for it and the cloud and well, what does it mean? I mean, I have to make like an AWS account and now I have to pay every month. And if there's more users, I have to pay more. So now all of a sudden I have to run a business, right? And I have to have revenues to do that and maybe that means I have to run raise an investment or I have to charge people and maybe I didn't want to do that I just wanted to create something right that like people wanted to use and uh and in Urbit you can kind of do that right I could develop some simple application maybe people love it and a million people are going to run it on their uh you know on their Urbits and I don't have to do anything, right? I don't have to charge anything. I don't have to pay for any infrastructure. And I, I think that's just going to be so attractive for developers. And uh, it's going to like unleash such a new class of applications people will build and people will play around with and so much creativity that becomes possible when you, when not everything has to be connected with some business that you have to build. Yeah, I, I would say generally, there's a, a very large class of questions that begin with why can't I just that Urbit um, allows you to just and, and shipping code to somebody's computer is, is, is definitely one of them. Why can't I just build an application, you download it for me and run it. Another one is why can't I just send you a file? Why do I need Dropbox? Right. These are these are just questions that you only have to ask because of the kind of insanity in computing. And Urbit, I think, is kind of um, fundamentally trying to provide that sanity. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what is Urbit today? You know, what's the current state of the technology and what are the limitations of the system? Sure, yeah. So um, today, first of all, Urbit does run. Sometimes we get asked that still, um, but it's been running since 2013. And uh, the so you can you can get an Urbit uh, you can buy one off Ethereum, um, and so you can buy an Urbit ID. Once you have that Urbit ID, you can boot your ship, which is the name for your node. So you can boot your Urbit. Um, you can run that yourself on your laptop, or pay one of uh, a few different hosting providers to run it for you, or you can run it yourself in the cloud if you're willing to do a little bit of system administration. Um, uh, you can also move it from any of those three places to any of the other ones. Um, and Gary actually has been working on standardizing the protocols for how that can be moved from place to place. But you can do it yourself already. 
Uh, so Urbit, you can, you can get one, you can run it, uh, and you can install apps into it. Uh, and uh, the ba it comes with a suite of apps. Uh, the flagship apps are uh, groups and chat. Uh, so you can chat in groups. Uh, it looks uh, looks a lot like Discord. It's or you know or um, or Slack, something like that, right? It's a it's a chat app. Um, it's sort of asymptotically approaching uh, feature parity with those. Uh, there was a recent update that made it a lot closer, actually. So now it has threaded conversations and uh, you know, emoji reactions, and you know, it's starting to feel very similar to any other chat app. So that's mostly what people use Urbit for right now. But you can also install. Uh, any number of other apps, and there are about over 80 of them that have been published publicly. It's hard to know how many of them exist total, but there are you know, yeah, many dozens that you can try out. And some of those are sort of more important than others, I would say. So for example, there's uh, one called Campfire that lets you do uh, video chat. That gets, uh, that's over WebRTC, but it's negotiated by Urbit. So it's fully decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer video calling. So, uh, and there are all kinds of other things that people are building. So that's where Urbit's at. Um, and the chat stuff works pretty well. There are some rough edges. Uh, I would say that the, um, the big limitations have to do with uh, scaling and hardening, and some with developer experience. So as a user, um, basically, you know, if you join a group that has more than a few thousand members, and there are a few of these groups, uh, then it, it might be kind of slow. Right? It works, but it's a bit slow. And if you're publishing a group that has many thousands of members, then you generally have to do some maintenance work on your server to make sure it doesn't run out of memory. So you know, Urbit is supposed to not require any maintenance from the user. It should maintain itself. Right? So it's not quite there yet. Uh, and in particular with scale. Right? So if you're supporting a lot of, a lot of subscribers, then you know, the system doesn't scale as well as it should. And so you have to do some maintenance work and things get slow. Um, and uh, so that has to do, the reasons for that are basically twofold. Um, well, th well, three, there are three reasons essentially. One is that there's a limitation to how much data you can store in your Urbit right now. Um, there's also, uh, oh, it just doubled, but it's still, it's still limited. Um, that, so there's a limit to that. There's a limit to the amount of network bandwidth that your Urbit can take advantage of. Um, so we're working on that as well. Um, and then finally, Urbit's programming language, NOC, uh, the machine code is, uh, is slow. Um, so, uh, the, so the combination of those three things uh, makes, puts some scaling limitations on the system. All three of those are under active development and uh, I don't expect any of them to be showstoppers, but, uh, but that's, that's the status. Um, so the other aspect is hardening. So basically, there, it's, this refers mostly to security, but some to reliability. So there's some reliability issues. There's still some bugs. Sometimes the thing crashes much, much less frequent than it used to be, but it still happens. Um, and uh, so getting the system to be really bulletproof, reliable, um, that's one of the big things we've got to do. And, um, and a very closely related phenomenon is making sure that uh, it can't be hacked into, right? So making sure that it's secure uh, so that people can't uh, get into your Urbit and you know, download all your chats. And you know, you know, we want people to be able to store private keys for you know, relatively small amounts of money, but, but you should be able to store private keys in Urbit and, and sort of anything other than like your life savings, it should be relatively safe. You should feel secure about it. Um, we're definitely not there yet. So as a caveat, like if you go play with Urbit, keep in mind, it has not been audited for security. There's a good chance that there are vulnerabilities in there. So uh, treat it accordingly. Um, but that's also under active development. Uh, so there's a hardening process that we're taking the system through. Uh, and the other piece of that, I would say, is um, uh, protection against denial of service attacks, which is, I think, going to be a sort of long tail of, of hardening to make it sort of able to resist uh, larger and larger and more and more well-resourced uh, groups of people uh, who are attempting to just shut down the network or at least shut down your ship on the network, your node. So there's a lot of work to be done on that front as well. Uh, also, not I, I'm not particularly you know, uh, worried about it, but it's, it's a fair amount of work in front of us to do that.
The third remaining uh, sort of limitation, I would say, is in developer experience. So um, basically, there's when it's a pretty new world, right? You got a whole new, whole new machine code, whole new language, whole new operating system, whole sort of paradigm of programming, and all these things are you know ten times newer than uh, the existing world. Um, and so there's a lot of tooling that Urbit doesn't have that other systems have. So a lot of the, so the, you know, this developer experience is very good already in some ways, but in other ways it needs a lot of work. And so a lot of that has to do with building tooling, building debuggers and having a better, you know, printer, pretty printer for data and a lot of other technical stuff. Um, but basically uh, making it just a lot, bring, building a lot of tools for developers. And there's a deeper piece of that, which is making sure that the, the APIs that are presented to a user space program or somebody writing an app to make sure that the way that you interface with the operating system is clean and easy to use. And in particular, easy to, it should make it easy to write a program that's correct. And so there's a big problem with this right now, which has to do with subscriptions. And so there's a, a whole sort of complex of uh, projects that we'll be working on over the next year or two called subscription reform to redo Urbit's uh, subscription system. So how you synchronize data from Urbit to Urbit, that should get a lot simpler, cleaner, uh, and, and more scalable as well. So there's a uh, roadmap.urbit.org uh, has, uh, that's a pretty new thing where, where we laid out the technical roadmap uh, for Urban. So if you're interested in going deeper on the technical details of exactly where the system's at and what needs to be done to, um, to improve it, uh, that has some pretty detailed uh, explanations and links to ongoing work on GitHub. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I was with Gary, we were actually looking a little bit at the roadmap the other day, and I have to say, it's like very nicely presented. And so we'll also link to that. Uh, so if people want to go deep and check it out, what are the timelines on this? Like when, when is Orbit, I, I, I don't know, do you see, do you see kind of different stages of readiness of Urbit coming up for different types of, I don't know, degrees of adoption and uh, what does that look like? And yeah, on, on what time frames? I think this is a little bit of an aggressive time frame, but I generally say around two years to get to uh, having a, uh, to have it be bulletproof and scalable enough and reliable enough, basically. So there's, the system will continue to improve basically forever. Um, the kernel itself will actually stop improving at some point. The version numbers go down to zero. We call this Kelvin versioning. And this is to standardize the system. Uh, so, um, so all the different parts of the kernel each have a Kelvin version. Those all go down to zero. Knock the machine code is at Kelvin four. And Gary and I actually did a podcast where we talked about what might cause it to go to uh, to, to version three, but uh, at the moment we don't actually see that happening. We think that's probably done. Um, but the kernel, uh, different parts of the kernel are at versions you know, 140 for the language, up to about uh, 400 for the standard library. Uh, so there are a finite number of versions that we have to play with there, which will take somewhere between 20 and 200 years to really congeal all the way down. Um, but the but that's the kernel. There's also the runtime, which is the the program that runs your Urbit. And that is not Kelvin version. And so that will continue to improve forever, but that's basically just making, um, making it uh, faster and faster over time. So there's no sort of fixed point. There's no like one point where we'll say Urbit is done exactly. Um, but uh, there's a point where we will be able to say this handles all the kinds of applications that we want it to handle. Uh, and I think we'll be able to handle most of those by two years from now. And, and so that includes having being able to confidently say, this thing is secure. Nobody's going to be able to you know, steal your data out of it, exfiltrate your data. Um, it'll scale reasonably well. So if you want to have a million people in a chat channel, two years from now, you should be able to have a million people in a chat channel. Um, so basically, it should, it should approach the level of scaling of Web 2. Um, and that's an interesting set of problems. Most people don't don't think of decentralized systems as being capable of scaling up to uh, the size of Web two, um, where you need you know many data centers to run it. Urbit actually is designed to do that. So there's a very interesting set of discussions to be had about how it plans on doing that. But I do think it's possible, uh, and we're on our way. So it'll scale some. 
it'll be quite re- it'll be quite secure. It should be quite reliable. Like the the, the program should not crash, um, and it should be relatively easy to write. It should at least be yeah. It should at least be uh, relatively straightforward to write an application that synchronizes data correctly without having to worry about correctness. So like where it gets, where it's a correct application without having to think too hard about it. Now, by two years from now, it may still have quite a bit of boilerplate, right? It might be kind of awkward, and clunky to, to write those programs. Um, but when you write them, you should be able to very quickly read them and say, yeah, okay, that's definitely right. Um, we're not there yet. And mostly what's missing there is the interface to subscriptions, the interface to synchronizing data. There are a few other things that aren't great either. Um, so I don't expect that that, that that API, right, like what it takes to write an application will be really, you know, smooth and just, you know, really polished by then. I think that'll take another couple of years to really get, uh, to really get nice. Uh, but it should be possible to hook into scalable content distribution uh, from an application so that you can support, you know, many people subscribing to you, like in the millions, um, and, uh, and to feel confident when you write it that it's correct and that the kernel is handling all of the sort of hard synchronization problems and other correctness issues for you. I was kind of wondering if there are any applications that you would like to see on Urbit that it's just not ready for because of, you know, the, the maturity of core development and, you know, when you think it'll be possible and what it will look like. Tons. Uh, okay. I want to store all my files in there. I have hundreds of gigabytes of, uh, you know, music recordings and photos, uh, uh, all kind, you know, hundreds of, uh, you know, papers that I've collected over the years that I want to read, computer science papers, um, ebooks, uh, tons of stuff. And I actually, I had them in Dropbox for a long time. Then I decided to stop paying for Dropbox. So I pulled them onto my computer. So now I have like 300 gigabytes of just crap sitting there on my computer. And I've been meaning to upload it somewhere else. And I haven't gotten around to it. And, uh, that should all be in my Urbit. And not only should it be in my Urbit, but yeah, I should be able to share that with you very easily. Right, so in order to share media with you uh, through Urbit, you need much higher. So first of all, I need to be able to store that data in Urbit. It's, it's too big right now. I need to be able to stream that to you, or you need to be able to download it quickly. So we have to be able to max out a network connection right, for the, for the bandwidth. So we need a better network protocol. And I need to be able to publish that to a lot of people. So we need scalability of the network protocol. So there's that, right? Anything with file sharing, podcasting, uh, you know, live streaming, uh, you should be able to do all that from your Urbit, right? And like, imagine doing a live stream from your Urbit. It's, it's fun to think of all the other stuff you could build in there, all the different kinds of interactivity uh, and you know, integrations with other, other Urbit apps. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other thing is I, I want to be able to store um, a lot of my private keys in Urbit. So I think like, yeah, uh, for, for stuff that's like where you really want to keep it cold, then okay, yeah, keep it cold. Don't put it in your orbit. But, but I want to have sort of what you know, where I'm paying my bills from, right? Uh, and where I'm, you know, sharing expenses with friends. You know, an, an orbit uh, version of um, uh, what's the app called where you like you all go to a restaurant and the uh, Splitwise, right? My friends and I use Splitwise for go to a restaurant. So it lets you settle up later. Right? I, I think there's say. another one too. So I think there's. Multiple. I bet there is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, like. That kind of app where it's like, yeah, here's how I handled my sort of day-to-day expenses, income, et cetera, right? Like that, I should feel comfortable storing that in my urban, right? And then, and not only that, but then from there, I can do things like have Urbit integrate with the Lightning Network, have it integrate with, uh, you know, the Aztec protocol on Ethereum, have it integrate with uh, Gnosis Safe, uh, Safe now, I suppose, um, right? Have it integrate with all this different stuff. So, but in order to do that, I have to be comfortable having some hot wallets inside my Urbit. Uh, and uh, so for that, it needs to be secure. Right? So there's this whole sort of big playground of all these things that could be built, right? It's like, there, those will be toys until we make Urbit secure, and then they can be done for real. And um, so I'm very much looking forward to those classes of applications. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the podcasting thing, because I think this is actually like a very powerful... Uh, example right so for those who like you don't know basically with podcasts right? podcasts are basically distributed via rss feeds 
And so as a podcaster, you know, you're putting up this uh, podcast recording and then uh, people download it and you don't, and, and there's a bunch of limitations that come with that. One is that you don't have any way of like messaging those people. Like if you want to build like a community of your podcast listeners, then, you know, you'd have to make this cumbersome thing of like, oh, you're listening to this audio. Now go and click in the link in the notes to go somewhere else. And then we do this community or uh, so, it's, so, but most, you know, 98% of people, they just like listen to it. And, and because it's so cumbersome, people don't even try. And of course, charging for podcasts is also basically not possible or, or it's only possible through these, again, very, very terrible hacks that people do. So I think this is something where, you know, if you can just uh, distribute your content, message everyone who's listening to it, maybe have better data about it too. Because I think this is another thing that podcasting is very limited with. Although I guess in Urbit, maybe this is also something Urbit will be limited with, no, since people... What do you mean more better data? Well, I mean, in podcasting, like you, you don't know, for example, do people actually listen to it or not? You only know oh, okay, the download so like analytics it. tracking that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I think people could hide the fact that they've listened to your podcast relatively easily, but most of your listeners probably wouldn't. Um, so if you kind of requested that information, I think most of your listeners would give it to you and you'd have a reasonable idea of, of what your audience looks like. Yeah. You can also track the networking requests coming into your orbit, right? So you can track just how many requests came in or I should say the, you could build this sort of analytics uh, to track that sort of thing on your Urbit. Um, there's a little bit of that in the Urbit runtime right now, but it's it's not as granular as it could be. But yeah, you could you could build a system like that so that anytime somebody tries to fetch this, well, they're fetching it from my Urbit, right? So I can tell. Um, you may not know that exactly if we end up building a sort of uh, distributed caching system, which is likely. Um, but yeah, some so yeah, Urbit it probably requires a little bit more work to get really good analytics. Which just has to do with sovereignty, actually, right? Like, there's like, there are some places where you have fundamental trade-offs between, you know, privacy and sovereignty, and you know, being able to track what people do, uh, which is the opposite of that. But, uh, but yeah, I think there there's quite a bit of middle ground in there. What about you, Gary? I mean, you mentioned the the example that I really liked, and I hadn't actually thought of in this way before of you know having this business that like is in a code, and you can kind of franchise it easily so i think that was a nice example but what else what are some other uh, use cases for orbit that you're most excited about uh, actually i think what i would find most useful are, are things that um, are currently possible and just need a little more developer effort so i'm very excited about uh, ngram a wholly owned product which should work towards kind of replicating the feature set of notion on orbit um, i personally find that if i'm journaling um, even if i pretty much trust that I'm not going to get snooped on by whatever third party owns my data. I'm just going to be a little more hesitant to really speak freely about what I'm thinking if I know that it does not, it's not private. And so um, and, and so I would much rather have something like that on my Urbit. And I personally prefer to journal on my local computer rather than a more powerful platform like Notion for that reason. And I think Urbit can do it. I think it's just um, a matter of developer effort and kind of getting the UX right. And another thing is, is task management. Uh, I use Task Warrior, which is a Linux program, and it works really well, but I would probably prefer for that to be on Orbit as well because I would have better sharing functionality and I wouldn't have to work within two different systems. You don't use Emacs? No, I don't use Emacs. <laughs> Ta task Warrior is good enough. No, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but no, I mean, these are kinds of ways where having a personal server makes a lot of sense because you have a variety of devices. I'm not going to carry my laptop necessarily to all the same places that I might carry a phone or a tablet, but I still want access to these basic things like my notes and the things that I want to do. Um, and these are low amounts of data. It's just important to me that I can access them from anywhere. And the only way to do that in a sovereign way right now is to deal with honestly just a very terrible UX and you know do probably you know more um, more Linux work than most people want to do. And I think Urbit is going to make that much more accessible and, and you know, more free. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we, we've touched on it in, in points, but about the, the kind of 
crypto orbit uh, synergy. So once orbit, you know, let's say two years from now, we have addressed some of those uh, issues around security, scalability, you know, you can keep your keys in orbit. It's pretty safe. Um, what, what does this convergence of crypto and orbit look like? And, you know, what are the most important implications of that? Yeah, I think there, this is, there are a lot of implications from it. Uh, and the convergence happens in several different ways. Um, and so it, there's actually a lot to talk about here, I think. So one is, um, the, let's, we can start with some basic ones, right? So it's basically like anytime I, that I, as a user want to interact with the chain, I should use my Urbit to do that. Um, so even if that's something simple, like I want to use Uniswap, right? There's a, there's an app on, on Urbit that serves the Uniswap, Uniswap front end, right? But I should be serving that to myself. And Urbit has very good properties for code signing, right? So the software supply chain uh, can be can be secured much more effectively on Urbit than through almost anything else, because we have a real PKI, or a real public key infrastructure, real identity system that actually lives on chain, um, right? Every Urbit ID is a, an NFT on Ethereum, and um, so. What that implies is that if I, um, I can have a lot more protection that the front end that's being served to me is not spoofed. It, there's no DNS spoofing. There's no other stuff, right? Like it's, it's something where I can really get a lot of verification that I'm, I'm using the piece of software that I mean to use. Uh, there've been huge hacks, right? Where somebody spoofed some front end and there go hundreds of millions of dollars. So. Uh, so Urbit, first of all, you know, that should be the place, that should be what serves a client to you, right? Some sort of, uh, any user interface you're using for interacting with change should be done through Urbit. Um, this also lets you do multi-party computation, right? So if you want to do uh, a multi-sig, um, then that should be, there should be an app for that. Uh, this would be a nice app to write. You could write it right now. Um, and, uh, and then that, you know, then, okay, we want to, you know, the three of us have a multi-sig, let's say, and we want to, you know, um, we want to move some funds. Okay, well, we can use the Urbit app to do that. We don't have to copy and paste addresses. Uh, we don't have to worry about backups for our keys. We don't have to worry about backups for the state, right? Like if you're tracking, uh, you know, the nonce of an Ethereum account, you can use your Urbit to store that and make sure that, and then you know that it's not going to get deleted. You're not going to forget it. You're not going to have, uh, you know, nonce reuse errors. That could cause security problems, right? This whole long tail, like things that can go wrong with crypto. And a lot of the stuff that people worry about with crypto in practice when using it is like, well, what if I copy and paste the wrong address into the wrong thing? And there goes all my life savings. Right? It happens. Uh, right. So what you need is some abstraction layer there. So say, look, I'm sending it to you. It's just my computer sending it to your computer. And yeah, I guess there are like public keys and addresses involved, but I don't want to think about it and I don't want to see it. Um, Right, like I don't, I don't really think about that to the extent that I have to think about that with normal banking. It's also a bit of a flaw, um, right? Like, uh, so, so there are those layers, right? So, okay, I can do my own stuff. I can have my own wallet in there. I can, I can, do, I can use it for multi-party computation. And then, yeah, I should also use it for storing all the client-side state, so all off-chain state that I need. So, if I'm using uh, Safe. Right, to manage some assets uh, and do other things like that. Um, my actual personal data has to be stored somewhere. Right? So I should store that in my Urbit. Another thing your Urbit can do for you is it can act as your watchtower. Right? So let's say you're doing something with uh, Lightning, right? um, or you know, that's not the only thing that needs a watchtower, but for some of these things where you have a, like a state channel, uh, you actually need some program running on your behalf, monitoring the chain to see if something happens. So that if something happens that's against you, this thing can uh, you know, do an adversarial close of the channel uh, and make sure that your funds don't get sold, right? So you can rely on somebody else to do that, or you can use your Urbit for that. Then there are deeper integrations, right? So something where basically uh, you want to have an application that's mostly off-chain, but has an on-chain component, right? So let's say you have a video game and there are in-game assets that you actually want an economy for. Right, uh, and you need double spend protection on those assets. Uh, so for that, there's uh, you can do that just sort of normally, right? Where you can write an Urbit app that's 
primarily an, you know, an in-urbit app, but also talks to a chain, you can do that by talking to existing chains. And then there's also the Ookbar project, um, which is aiming to, uh, they're building uh, a ZK rollup as a layer two on Ethereum uh, that where you where that uses knock Urbit's machine code as it's to write smart contracts. Um, so they do ZK proofs of uh, of knock code, right? So this allows you to uh, write uh, your your application in Urbit's programming language, and you also write some little piece of it that stays on chain, and those share the same data types. They share, share the same helper libraries. Uh, they communicate very seamlessly with one another. So you, you, there's also um, a lot less code involved in deploying that application, right? So one of the big problems with deploying dApps as they're currently conceived of is that you write a little bit of solidity, but most of what you write is JavaScript because, well, you know, there's actually a lot more code that runs off-chain than runs on-chain. And so you have to still deal with all this Web2 stuff, all the difficulties of deploying a Web2 application, along with the difficulties of deploying a Web3 application, because you can't screw up the solidity either, right? So uh, it's actually just a pretty scary thing to try to do. Uh, so Urbit doesn't, doesn't necessarily make the, the smart contract part of it that much easier, uh, but everything else around that, it's a lot easier to integrate that into an application. Um, and then there's an even deeper layer, I would say, uh, of integration between Urbit and blockchains. And this is more speculative, more sort of philosophical, but basically I've been thinking about this lately that um, blockchains have an oracle problem. Just in general, if any data is going to be put onto the chain as a transaction input, the data has to come from somewhere off chain. It can't be verified just by, you know, uh, by being on chain the way that sort of derived data can be. Right. Um, Right, so a general, uh, you know, so it's like a, let's say, you know, you want to pay me for doing some work. Um, well, how do you, how do you know that I actually did the work? Right. And so something, somebody has to put that data on chain, right? And that's an Oracle problem because when they put that data on chain, you have to try to figure out, well, how does that, how does, how do we know that that's true? That that's accurate information. Right. So Chainlink has a whole system for this, right? I think there are a bunch of others. There are, but Chainlink is for you know, or Oracle for price data, and so that has particular characteristics where you can, you know, you can sort of average them out and throw out the outliers and have some economic incentives to to get a good answer there, right? Um, but that only applies for certain kinds of data, uh, and for a lot of those sort of a lot of what people were interested in blockchain solving back in 2017, 2018 that never or that have not yet panned out, I should say. Things like you know, using it for a, you know, the title for your house, right? Or like these sort of more real world, you know, tokenizing physical assets. Um, some of that's probably just a bad idea generally, but there are I, my guess is that there are several of those that actually are good ideas, but they're not feasible yet. And what's needed to make them feasible is includes a more generic, and more well, like a more general purpose uh, Oracle system. And so Urbit, I'll, 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 I will actually get to the point here. The, uh, uh, I, I, one of the ways I see Urbit is as a general purpose Oracle system, uh, like a low, the lowest layer of an Oracle system where basically you want, to put, you want to put some data on chain. Okay, well, it comes on chain signed by the Urbit that produced it and located within Urbit's scry namespace. So this is a very technical concept, but basically Urbit has a, a way of assigning a permanent immutable name to a piece of data uh, and attesting to that by signing it uh, with using the Urbit's, public, Urbit's private key, verifiable by anybody. Um, and so it's a way of laying out all the data that gets produced by any Urbit on the network and having that Urbit attest to that data. So at the moment, there's no double spend protection or there's no, uh, there's no Byzantine fault protection on this. So there's nothing to say that I can't run a malicious Urbit kernel that signs two different versions of the same data at the same path. But, and, and most of it doesn't, most of the data that Urbit deals with doesn't need that protection and so shouldn't have it because you actually, again, you only want blockchains for certain things. But uh, you can take that data, you could write a contract um, uh, that, that does enforce Byzantine fault tolerance on those, on those bindings. 
And then basically you could use that as a way of just ingesting arbitrary data from anyone's personal computer. And it comes attested to by them, you know, who they are, not, I mean, you don't know their, you know, social security number, but, but you can tie that identity to other, other actions that that Urbit has taken. It does develop reputation. Um, and so because it develops reputation, that's where you can build systems of trust. You can build reputation systems, on-chain reputation systems that deal with this, that you could use programmatically to filter uh, all this data. So this is a whole line of thinking. None of this has been built yet. It's, uh, it's just sort of something that's been rolling around in my head. But I think there's something fundamental there, right? Where basically blockchains are, deal- are speci- specifically for dealing with objective data, right? Like what is objectively the sort of consensus truth about something? Urbits are designed for dealing with subjective data. What is my version of this? What is your version of this? And uh, so I think they, these, these two things complement each other very well. And you need both of them uh, to really build a sort of uh, cryptographically sound world. Right? You need a world that has hardness, as Josh Stark described in his essay of uh, uh, atoms, institutions, and blockchains. Right? And block, those are, as, as civilization progresses, the hardness of our institutions increases. Um, blockchains do a great job of hardening currency, contracts, potentially law, um, but not anything subjective, really. And so for, so Urbit is really where you harden the sort of subjective reality. Um, I don't know what you think about that. But. Yeah, I, I want to ask about one thing that I've been you know, pondering a little bit, and I'm kind of like unsure how this is going to play out, right? So today in Web2, obviously privacy is pretty bad or, or, or ter- maybe terrible, right? And Urbit has this, you know, fundamentally different paradigm that, you know, it gives you more privacy in some ways, right? Because like your program runs on your Urbit and your data is there, but at the same time, because everything you do on the network is like associated with your planet ID. It, it all there it also seems to be the kind of this aspect where maybe there's less privacy too, or like, you know, at least in the current system, you know, you can make like different usernames, use different emails, make different accounts and so I'm curious, like, how, how you think this is going to play out? I would say there's more accountability, right? And that does cut both ways. Because, yeah, if you get... because So basically, in Urbit, you have this ID, and it's typically a very permanent ID. Like, people get really attached to them. I'm very attached to Ravnus Rickfer. Gary, if somebody took Tiller Tolbus away from you, I imagine you would not be very happy with this. You get attached to it the way you get attached to your sort of normal human name. It's a little odd, honestly. It's like it, that's part of the system works a lot better than I would expect it to. Um, but there's quite a bit of empirical evidence for this. People getting very attached to their name. So you get attached to your name because that's really who you are on the network. Uh, it's how people know you. Um, and I think that'll only increase as people start doing things like financial transactions through Urbit and other sort of more serious, um, more serious uses. Um, and so, yeah, there is a trade-off there somewhere, abstractly, right? Between, you know, can you, between being accountable for your actions on the one hand, which also means, you know, you have a reputation. So developing, the development of social capital requires attributability of actions, right? Like you have to know that it was me in order for, develop, in order to, for me to develop that, that reputation. Um, but then conversely, you know, if I do something wrong, then, you know, my... And everyone will spit whenever they hear my name right, for generations to come. And the, the sins of the father shall be uh, revisited upon the child or whatever, right? Interestingly, I think blockchains have a very similar problem, right? Where like the provenance of, tra- provenance of transactions is actually completely visible on, ch- on a chain, the way it's maybe not within a more tra- traditional banking system. And so, and Urbit actually takes the same approach that blockchains do, which is you have a layer of pseudonymity, right? So... Any particular Urbit ID, yeah, that that accrues reputation, but that ID is not tied back to your real world identity unless you want it to be. Yeah, I should mention that um, that 
anonymity is possible on Urbit. People will know you're anonymous. And, and in most contexts, you may want to be unaccountable in a given situation, but the other people in that situation probably want everybody else around them to be accountable, and you would probably like everybody else to be accountable too. So while anonymity is possible, um, it actually makes it more difficult to socialize in many ways. Um, so I think, I think just like in Web2, on Urbit, we will see some anonymous social happenings, but the majority of, of interaction will be um, accountable with this kind of skin in the game based system. Yeah. So specifically, there's a, a type of Urbit idea that's called a comet. You don't have to buy it. You can create an infinite number of them effectively. Um, and yeah, you can throw them away. They're ephemeral. And so they're, they're anonymous IDs. Uh, and interestingly, yeah, we find that most substantial groups ban them um, because they tend to be trolls. Uh, but there are places where they're not banned because people really want to have anonymous conversations. So you know, it's different use case. Different use cases imply different things, and so you can you can do both with Urbit. So I guess there's um, there's Urbit.org, developers.urbit.org is the best place for engineers who want to learn more. If you want to get started using Urbit. As a, as a user, there's getting started link at, um, at urbit.org as well. So that's all very polished and, and user friendly nowadays. Yeah, and we're still working on it too. It's getting better. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just very excited. I mean, today and also just for like, you know, what does it look like today, right? I mean, it, there are some of these applications. But I think right now what really works is just these groups, right? So you have some community and you can message each other in chat and it's like, it's pretty nice. Um, and I think that's already something that, you know, at least for a lot of people, it's enough to kind of trigger a lot of thinking and a lot of seeing of possibilities. But I think what I'm super excited about is, you know, the point where we really have compelling applications, you know, they're like actually cool. And I think we're pretty close. I don't think we're there yet, right? I, I mean, at least personally, I haven't used anything where it's like, you know, this is really cool beyond just illustrating some possibility of what could be in the future. But I, you know, I would guess that this is, is something that we'll get to within the next six to 12 months. And I think at that point, uh, it's it's just going to be very exciting, right? Especially to have people from crypto like come over and explore a bit. And I think there's going to be, you know, an avalanche of innovation and adoption that's going to happen after that. I agree. Yeah, I would say if you're um, if you want to play with Urbit, it's it's fun to play with, and uh, there's some interesting groups. You know, there's actually quite a few different social groups on Urbit that, that um, are very different from one another. So the the idea that we're going to foster the development of subcultures has been empirically true so far. Um, and, uh, but then I think the, the thing that's really exciting about Urbit right now is if you're a developer, um, because this is a really good time to get involved and play with it, right? Build something, take a weekend, uh, maybe it takes a week if you've got to learn the programming language first. Um, maybe it takes a little longer, but it's not that bad. Uh, and then Learn your way around the system, build an app, uh, and you can build it and publish it, and it's really easy. And then, and then talk to people about it, and uh, you know, you might get some nice positive feedback, you make it you know, actual users very quickly. Um, and there are all kinds of apps that should be written for crypto integration. So if you're coming from crypto, especially, uh, I mean that's strategically that's strategically interesting uh, for us at Urbit, and uh, you may be able to get a grant from the Urbit Foundation to work on something like that. Um, we have a grants program you should check out, uh, bounties. Uh, so there, there are a lot of different ways of getting involved. Um, and also you can get on the network and talk to people about what they, uh, you know, what they want to build, work with some other people. So yeah, I think, uh, this is, it's a really fun time to get involved with Urbit because, uh, it's at the point where the, you know, app development and app distribution is somewhat mature. It's a mature enough that it's not a huge pain. Uh, and then also, but despite that, it's still very young. And so there's still a lot of low hanging fruit that needs to be written. Uh, that's uh, not too not too hard to do. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Ted. And thanks so much, Gary. It was really a pleasure to have you guys on. And it was a pleasure. I think this was a nice 
uh, a nice other introduction about Arvid because I think often you need quite a few introductions about Arvid so I'm pretty sure people will enjoy this and I'm also sure this is not going to be the last time we're going to talk about Arvid but there's going to be a lot more to come and I think the next year the next two years what's ahead is going to be incredibly exciting so I'm um, you know, I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. And um, yeah, also so grateful for you, Ted, like for doing all this work in trying to get this platform to maturity. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. All right. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, let us know how you like the show on Twitter or leave us a review if you want to support us. And then we look forward to being back next week.